Paul, you sent me an article. It was called Planetary Intelligence, A Way Out of the Climate Crisis. So can you give us a little bit of insight? How can planetary intelligence kind of help us out of this debacle? The, wow, that, the, so we have two main, we have two main issues um, for humanity to, uh, my anthropologist advisors and colleagues refer to it as to mature as a species. Um, others will refer to it as evolution, but we have a, we have a consciousness dilemma and which translates to values. And then we have a systems dilemma, which translates to the systems that we utilize to exist on the planet. And that, that's our infrastructure systems predominantly. Um, the consciousness component is really at, at the root of it is we've been entrained um, for decades and eons through multiple mediums that we are separate from nature versus part of nature. So that's why there's been kind of this renaissance of the wisdom traditions and the fundamental component of the wisdom traditions that is intended to be revitalized is the, the conscious awareness that we are part of a greater system versus separate from. Um, and our systems that currently exist today also reside in that separate from nature. It was that they were designed to overtake nature versus harmonize with nature. We see that in agriculture, we see that in energy systems and, and, and massive consumerism, right? We've, we've basically become a parasite in a larger system versus a symbiont, um, which exists in harmony. And we are, I mean, the human body is a symbiont. I mean, there are viruses and microorganisms that are in the, in the millions and even trillions in our bodies alone that work in harmony um, versus in parasitic, which we've witnessed through other recent virus pandemic kind of things. There's, there's two ways that we can either coexist or uh, exist in a, in a parasitic and disruptive manner. And this is where I would encourage everybody to go vegan, because as a vegan, that's my job to propagandize and tell everybody to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there, well, there's an interesting, the, there's a point of demarcation there um, in that absolutely, uh, you know, plant-based diets uh, and agriculture, um, you know, natural agricultural processes, horticulture, permaculture uh, methods, but we do need, we need grazing animals to keep the soil healthy. So if you if you follow soil health, um, we need we need grazing animals to do that, mm -hmm. and so there's there's a balance. Um, we used to have a lot significant grazing animals uh, like buffalo or bison in the United States, which were basically wiped out um, to starve the indigenous uh, people. Um, and uh, now there's this revitalization that we need to reintroduce. Um, you know, Alan Savory is a great example of kind of a pioneer to say we need to reintroduce uh, grazing animals um, uh, back into the environment to support uh, soil health. So uh, I'm with you on the we need to uh, eat less, but that eat less meat um, for sure. But that that meat source, we need to eliminate these factory farms that are pretty much just amplifying toxicity. Yeah, well, I would say, that, you know, big winds would sweep through Kansas and, and scoop up, you know, metric tons of hog urine and, and dump it on some poor unsuspecting town about 10 miles down the road. And uh, we've known about right. this for a long, long time. So how do we get to a point of scaling up sustainable kind of regenerative farming? Yeah, have you looked at that? Regenerative farming is, you know, I think the challenge uh, that I'm seeing, you know, I mean, documentaries like The Need to Grow are, you know, part of that transition. It's, a, it's an awareness 
standpoint from one, but it's also a change. Um, and humans are uh, resistant to change. Um, and fundamentally, going back to the conscious aspect of it, our greatest fear is the fear of the unknown. So the, the, the training and um, planning systems need to be able to uh, convey through virtual technologies um, what a future plan looks like to help people overcome the fear of the unknown. So that translates to urban planners, um, to you know, rural agricultural communities, that are using old methodologies, uh, you know, uh, using pesticides, spraying pesticides, um, exposing the soil uh, where it's basically dead uh, for a portion of this uh, year instead of having year round growth and root productivity um, going on. So the it, it's Ah, uh, you know that that's a that's a huge question because like where where are we going to change? And right now, I believe it's the communities that are receptive to changing their uh, their systems and ways um, because of threats from you know uh, climate ca catastrophes. Uh, so that's why I've been kind of focusing on the rebuild side. The, the less affected communities, kind of like ch uh, complex adaptive systems, you don't change them from the center, you change them from the edge. And uh, then you introduce new systems um, and making the old systems obsolete. Mm. So and, and you make sure you make goes. and you try to anticipate some knock on effects that would go uh, kind of bleed into other systems and, and stuff like that. Um, so you spent also some time recently uh, working with the people that were releasing radioactive waters at Fukushima. Is that right? That's that's correct. Not necessarily. Well, we, we tried to work with uh, the Japanese government and the operating company. Uh, called TEPCO of the Fukushima nuclear power plant um, and uh, presenting alternative solutions um, and then basically uh, trying to get them to stop their, uh, their existing plan, which was basically to dump uh, radioactive water into the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Which they did, am I right? Yeah, they did that in August of, of this year. So, um, so yeah. what what was the implications there? What 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 can you look forward to for for an action like that? What are the potential consequences for something that stupid? Well, the as as a species, we have been um, dumping all kinds of waste into the into our waterways. Uh, uh, estuaries, rivers, um, oceans, uh, putting it into the air and putting it into the soil. And um, the, the Fukushima um, threat, uh, was I was brought into the process by representatives from the Buckminster Fuller Institute um, asking to help with the kind of the tactical counter um, initiative uh, to get them to stop. So to stop doing that and consider all other alternatives. So we brought in expertise from the oil and gas industry that are familiar with remediation of radioactive waste um, to biologists uh, that have been developing other solutions. Um, and they built an eight foot uh, I think it's eight feet, eight feet, eight foot diameter pipe to basically dump, just dump it, which is the, the, under the, um, concept of the solution to pollution is dilution, um, that those chemical standards, uh, are at the international level. Um, and now we've, as if you're familiar with the, the planetary boundaries, um, we've exceeded six of the nine planetary boundaries over the last two decades. And they, uh, for me, it just represented we need to stop adding all of this toxic pollution to our environment because 
Now the thing that's kind of escalating beyond climate change is what they're calling biodiversity loss. And the, the contemporary term for biodiversity loss is what they're calling omnicide, where we've killed off a tremendous amount of life on the planet. And um, those consequences, you know, we, we heard about, you know, uh, plastic straws and turtles, um, the fishing nets killing all kinds of life. We have microplastics in the air, water, and soil all over the planet now. We have forever chemicals, PFAS chemicals throughout the planet. Um, we need to like reconsider, this is the parasitic model, right? Consume, extract, uh, gluttonize that consumerism, and then create a massive amount of waste in all categories. So and then- that's the process that we need to change and then sell you some medicine after you get sick and are dying it's you know oh it, well exactly and it really only addresses the symptoms not the cause exactly exactly so, yeah and um, i'm wondering other than you know microplastics and pfas and stuff like that we also have antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria and we're starting to have fungicide resistant fungi so what what are some what are we supposed to do as individuals besides be incredibly depressed? How do what do you suggest that the average individual does to lessen the kind of you know catastrophic demise that we're heading towards? Um well, I think one is uh you know recognize our our individual uh lifestyle and you know is it con- is it contributing um to this trajectory or can you do something to counter it so you mentioned like you know becoming a vegan and i think the where you buy your food um how it's sourced i think is incredibly important um, you know, the organic farmers, uh, have been on a very challenging course for decades. And so when you buy your, when you buy your vegetables, your fruits and vegetables, um, buy, buy organic, organically, uh, produced, um, fruits and vegetables, the, um, you know, conserve energy as much as you can, even though, the recycling programs are only four to six percent of everything that gets uh because it was deferred to the consumer the responsibility not not the producers of those materials um which was a huge scam in my opinion the um you know try and buy materials that are packaged in something that's compostable um versus a plastic container um so the uh you know i just saw um some of the the alcohol industry is now moving away from glass uh and moving toward uh using more plastic because it saves money for shipping costs there's less damage uh and uh but it it just accelerates the problems that that we're experiencing and plastic waste which comes from the fossil fuel industry, um, you know, and the material sciences, we need to come up with uh, alternative solutions. But doesn't our our entire religious kind of economic kind of system uh, impose on us that we absolutely have to consume massive amounts of frivolous goods? Well, you are, that's referring to, um, really what uh what i've been uh, kind of referring to as entrainment we have been entrained to consume and live in big houses and this absolutely ridiculous uh lifestyle um uh that uh is consumer consumerism based right the um but I think the, 
you know, the, the younger generation has, has realized this, you know, the debt models economically, either from student, student loans to, you know, mortgage, which is a life contract, if you translate that, um, for these things that don't really bring happiness um, and health and well-being, um, I think there's a there's a value uh, transition going on with the the shared economy. Um, I mean, even something as simple as like Uber, right? U Uber is sharing an asset, a vehicle, right, among multiple people. Where the transport studies show that most people's vehicle sits uh, uh, more than ninety percent of the time. Um, so it's this kind of stranded asset that required a, an excessive amount of energy um, to produce, and now we're in this massive transition between ICE or internal combustion engines and electrified motors. Um, and then their residual impacts around batteries and more extraction of natural resources. But, uh, you know, there's so uh, travel, uh, travel smartly, walk, bike, public transport as much as possible, um, and which is good for you. It's, it's <laughs> healthy. You're out in, in the environment, which also creates a conscious connection to our environment, oh, which sure. we've been isolated in all of these controlled environments. So what's happening with the environment, like the whole one and a half, we have to avoid one and a half degrees. A lot of people are like, I'll just turn my air conditioner up or I'll just turn my heater up um, for those changes. It, the consequences of that uh, uh, climate change um, hasn't really been realized to its fullest extent, like food shortages and um, other inconveniences like cities getting wiped out from hurricanes or uh, or there's no food so no food resources. I mean the, the toilet paper rush of COVID really highlighted how I mean our objective is that we can implement these flagship or lighthouse communities in different places on the planet to serve as guides, guideposts, like, oh, it can be done this way, different economic system, different governance systems, um, the different ways of manufacturing and producing uh, everything from, you know, how do you process your waste uh, by using different materials uh, in the first place, or how do we how are we going to sequester all of these all of this waste plastic being an example using new methodologies like pyrolysis to um, convert that in down to the molecular level and using those like the carbon um, to manufacture carbon uh, fiber types of materials uh, instead of plastic uh, and or graphene for all kinds of uh, applications. And they're using, they're already doing that for aviation and other kind of leading um, uh, manufacturing uh, technologies and engineering capabilities. And we hope that the technology will save us instead of continuing to create things that we have to regulate at a later date, which has been sort of the common theme with all of technology since the beginning of time. It, it ends up changing us in ways that we didn't expect, and we have to turn around and say, okay, well, we have to re rethink this. But so about as far as electric cars are concerned, isn't this another kind of uh, isolationist kind of invention, or an addition to a kind of a bad idea? The, the, the combustion car was to this isolated kind of symbol of American consumerism and stuff. Shouldn't we be building more public transportation? Absolutely. Uh, public transportation um, is, is key. You know, a number of the European cities uh, that have, um, and even uh, some Asian cities uh, like Shanghai have, really implemented, you know, they have the high speed trains to, to cover long distances. Um, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, even like the shared resources, like the scooters and I mentioned like Uber types of things where you're sharing resources uh, that I consider that kind of public transportation because public has access to that. So there's a lot of different layers of public 
uh, transportation that can be utilized, but that boils down to um, how we're planning all the sprawl for a lot of the, the cities that are experiencing this kind of migration away from uh, rural communities toward the cities. So they're seeing this movement there, but the, the predominant kind of model is what they're calling the 20 minute city. And that's creating kind of like these cells, community cells that have most of the resources that you need and they're connected by public transport. Um, and then that can get you from one cell or one 20 minute city to another 20 minute city where there might be different resources that you need to have access to arts and entertainment, for example, uh, or other more um, uh, resources that need some type of consolidation or distribution point. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a different model than the sprawl models that they're using right now in most uh, municipal planning and urban planning. Yeah. You know, America was founded on this, this bad idea of very suburban, isolated, you know, big yards, everything like that. But I moved to Europe recently and I realized that they have a better idea about how to use a small amount of space more efficiently. And so even if we did kind of lean back that direction, we would we would be doing to get rid of some of the super highways and and stuff like this. Yeah, it's it's uh a lot of the planning has been industry based not innovation based and not environmentally based so um you know that's why the you know the proliferation of uh internal combustion engines um you know that's that's a huge industry and you know since you referenced the us that industry has even experienced bailouts right to stabilize the the stabilize the economy and we've seen these bailouts to industries spanning the automotive or what would be better instead of automotive, um, the transportation industry um, and the uh, to to finance, right? The multiple issues with economic collapse around the financial industry catalyzed by corruption predominantly. Sure, sure. greed. Um, so there's, there's this, where does the, where do we let those systems collapse without allowing chaos to take place? The best way to do that is to install new systems, complete systems, whole systems um, that deem the old system obsolete. And so that's where we're looking at um, the resilience side, communities that are interested in building resilience into their infrastructure and their and their culture, um, as well as uh, implementing regenerative systems. And I consider, you know, like um, uh, permaculture a regenerative system because it it provides benefits. What the the economics industry and most of the financial community refers to as externalities, right? It's like you can extract all of these things, but there's external consequences. I mean, just think about the, uh, uh, the appliance industry, right? So they produce, or the, the computer industry, they extract these um, materials out of the planet um, and they, they build this thing. They have a very short life cycle and then it ends up becoming a toxic waste uh, in landfills. Yeah. Um, everywhere which is polluting water air and soil and i think the scariest aspect of this is is it not that uh, that humans are animals too and and you know bound to the same biological habits to where we might just overextend ourselves to a point where uh there will be a collapse but and, and like you said it will be with omnicide as well we're going to take them all all the living creatures on earth down with us if we're not careful yeah, and that's what's happening. I mean, we uh, I'm working with um, marine biologists and uh, physiologists uh, or uh, physicists that are focused on like hydrology and and things like that. So, so for example, one of the earlier warning signs that we got was 
what they called uh, acid rain, um, and it changed the chemistry of the of the ocean, especially along coastlines. And and part of that comes from uh, excessive carbon in the atmosphere, um, but it's also from a lot of the waste that we've been dumping into the oceans. So I re I uh, uh, visited uh, actually, and I brought my family with me um, to the Pacific Northwest, where they basically farm oysters and clams and uh, other crustaceans. And what ended up happening was the ocean used to be an, a natural environment to farm and harvest these the crustaceans but the changes of water chemistry um disallowed the growth of the um kind of infantile or infant uh crustaceans they they can't exist in that water so they had to build these tanks um on land and work with all the different marine biology universities to try and change the water chemistry so these small, uh, the infant crustaceans um, could survive. And then they put them in tanks and then they fly them. Once they reach a certain age, they're resilient to the current ocean chemistry. And th then, then, then they would basically plant them in the, replant them in the ocean because uh, they were old enough to be resilient to that thing. That was an early sign, but we have killed off what the marine biologists refer to as the SML layer in the ocean, which is where all these microorganisms exist. And they, uh, they, uh, they help the water evaporate. So, you know, they're part of the water cycle, hydro hydrolog hydraulically hydrologically, sorry, <laughs> stuttered on that one. You um, did it. Too you many did. Uh, isms and ollicles and uh, yeah. everywhere. But the uh, that, if we start to clean up what we're putting into the ocean, those microorganisms have a very rapid recovery rate. And so they, and they um, convert carbon to oxygen. They become a fuel for larger organisms. Um, and so that is a rapid recovery methodology that we need to implement, which is basically let's prevent all of these toxins from reaching the ocean, you know, catching them in estuaries and river systems and so on, and uh, let the ocean recover because we have so many coastlines uh, on a planetary level. And those are the high risk areas as well for climate change. Um, so, and there are so many areas on the planet where they're dumping raw sewage into the ocean and it's, you know, it's making it, it's making it toxic. So, and there's um, natural, uh, what they call, um, they're calling nature-based solutions. There's very simple uh, solutions that we could implement inexpensive to stop all that pollution from getting into our air, water, and soil that's kind of where we need to systemically start is let's stop shitting all over the planet don't shit talk <laughs> don't so, shit where you eat you don't need to edit that out but. no i mean come on we're up shit's shit's creek without a paddle at this point um yeah so uh you know and we've lost uh you know 70 percent of our wildlife since the year 1900 and other estimates like this so it's hard to stay positive in this in this aspect but so what if out of all these things what would you say was the most pressing and what would you go after as like priority n numero uno um at, at what scale from the individual scale or? from the global not not just people but wildlife the, for the entire net of biodiversity uh, what is the one thing that would be the good thing to focus on? There's a lot of answers I, for humans, right? There's a lot of, like, what would make humans life better, but, um, right. I think, uh, one is, you know, I'm seeing, um, you know, civil uprising globally. Um, you know, we, we have, we, we had a lot, we, uh, just with the Fukushima thing, 
you know, we had, I mean, check my notes. It was like, I think we had, we had eight countries and 14 different cities um, engaged in the process. And I think the, um, you know, voting for people that have the environment as a priority, because this is our only, this is our only place to live. Right. I mean, we have billionaires that are trying to figure out how to, you know, live on the moon and on the, uh, on Mars, but we need to, we need to fix the systems that we have here. Right. First. So environmental concerns, get active, um, you know, share your voice, I think is critically important. Um, there are, there's a movement, um, in Germany, for example, um, and in the UK, well, in Europe, there's a, there's a group that I've been, um, kind of working in parallel with called dark matter labs. And they're trying to catalyze what they're calling a new European Bauhaus, um, which is a complete, you know, implementing a, the, our infrastructure influences our behavior, our behavior influences the kind of infrastructure that we have. Right. So it's this synonymous effort that uh, does both of them at the same time. Um, so support the organizations that are uh, struggling to implement change. Um, that would be, I think, one of the most important things. Uh, the, you know, there, we need to create and, and inspire hope again. Um, we are uh, uh, amazing creatures from an innovation standpoint. Most of the solutions, the elements uh, are already in existence. I mean, everything from, you know, distributed ledger technologies um, that become like cryptocurrencies um, to create local economies to um, bioremediation technologies that like you, I think you mentioned mushrooms earlier. Mm -hmm. There are um, uh, mycelia that know how to um, uh, break down some of these uh, petroleum based products. Um, and that translates to, you know, permaculture, new methodologies for agriculture. Um, so, you know, support the, the farmers, uh, buy products from farmers that are, they're doing their best to produce, um, you know, uh, uh, organic products. Um, is, is another thing. And then support any of the organizations that you see that are trying to press forward um, using these new methods and technologies, um, which can also be referred to as old methods and technologies too, depending on how you look at it, um, uh, that create uh, uh, and enables humanity to exist symbiotically. Um, within the within our our biosphere, our our living environment, you would say I, I would, I, and I would probably agree. But you would probably say there's plenty of things we can do right away that would uh, that are easy to implement and are much more efficient than the systems we have. Right? Yeah, and the the, the menu of those things is growing, right? But you know, try buy products that uh, aren't in plastic containers to get rid of your lawns and, you know, go Zurich, um, or let, let these, uh, uh, farming co-ops use that land and that soil to grow, uh, foods locally, um, to, uh, oh, I'm, I mean, anything, um, we haven't figured out there are some solutions around, you know, uh, biofuel production, um, especially from our waste or the slash from agriculture. Um, you know, the biofuels are, are kind of in production. Um, hydrogen is another area that has still been kind of uh, back shelved in some categories, but uh offers a tremendous opportunity um the i mean even the the electrification of things i'm seeing a movement of 
moving away from uh, natural gas appliances toward electric appliances, because at least now we know, and it, it's, it's a phased approach um, that we need to take, but um, at least we know that we can produce electricity um, from re renewable sources, wind, uh, tidal, uh, and, um, and solar. Um, and we're getting better at, um, uh, we're on an exponential innovation curve with those kinds of technologies. Um, we have to figure out what to do with the waste. Um, and there's tech, there's also technologies around that where we can basically, uh, backtrack and break those, um, those things down into their molecular elements and then reuse those. Um, mm. So uh, true, that's true that's recycling, like a true recycling, not just a 10% or whatever, but a fully efficient uh, recycling program. Um, but yeah, and also, you know, I would say again, go vegan. Beans are this magical thing. They fix nitrogen in the soil. They're this ultimate kind of protein form. Um, and I think beans could really help too. So I always throw beans out there as part of the solution. Um, so, and we, everybody talks about degrowth a lot, but we don't have to be, you know, homicidal or you know, about it. We can, we can slowly divest from doing things. Okay. It would take the cheese off the cheeseburger. Maybe well, let's, let's try to start small. Um, so one more question before we go, uh, you're a man of the world. You've traveled a bit. We'll end on a happy note. Uh, where tell me some of the most beautiful places you've been uh well i have to i have to um compliment colorado which is where i grew up i think colorado is one of the most amazing places um i was invited to new zealand by maori elders and i was only able to uh tour the the northern island um and then covid uh, broke out. So I wasn't able to see the Southern Island, which I've been told by colleagues that uh, work for the National Science Foundation and go to Antarctica. Uh, in fact, he'll be leaving um, in the next couple of weeks to back to Antarctica, that the South Island has a lot of similarities to Colorado. Um, I've just, I've seen, there's so many uh, beautiful places all over the world that, um, that I, I would like to see both on land and under the water, um, you know, Australia, you know, the great barrier reef and the, uh, even, um, the, on the, uh, Gulf side of, of Mexico, uh, is stunning. Uh, Roatan. I mean, the list of amazing, beautiful places all over the world. Uh, they're, er they're I mean, they're everywhere. Um, so the and I, I but one part of our hope um, and strategy is uh, creating um, a this shift in consciousness that we talked about before is to catalyze empathy for biophilia, right? And so the biophilia is the love of life, right? So how do we um, redirect? the um the current consumer consumerism based media uh toward empathy toward biophilia because there are so many amazing places that we can give virtual tours you don't need to get into a jet but you can experience them and appreciate them um virtually uh, initially and then if you want to visit them physically that would be fantastic i mean even the uh, the um, the astronauts uh, uh, coined a phrase uh, called the overview effect. And that's when they looked back at the planet and they saw that this thing was alive. It's not just a whole bunch of disparate living things, but the whole thing is alive. And uh, so like IONS Institute, the Institute of Noetic Sciences uh, was founded by Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut. And he's like, how do we facilitate this empathy toward biophilia? And uh, he kind of, they, you know, in the seventies, they said, well, maybe we could create these virtual experiences um, so people can see how amazing 
the life is on this planet so that's that was my plan that was my plan I, that was my cure for billionaires was to give them a lot of lsd and drop them into a rainforest and let them just work their way out and see <laughs> i love it <laughs> <laughs> maybe they come out on the other side with some new ideas about life you know I, I, a funny note about that is I worked with the United Nations Environmental Program and their digital ecology initiative. And I, I won't divulge the, the individual, but he was a leader in that, in that group. He said, should we like form these uh, like groups, what we refer to as impact ecologies at local levels and have them experience some type of a plant medicine type of immersion? And uh, I, I was all for it. Sounds and, familiar, uh, yeah. Because the common denominator from uh, uh, even near-death experiences where the body produces naturally its own um, DMT, uh, the, that's the common molecule. They call it you know, the spirit molecule. Um, that exists in uh, a lot of the psychotropics, right? Um, ayahuasca's to psilocybin's um, and more. And, uh, but the common denominator of those experiences is you, you feel, you empathically experience a connection with nature. Yeah. And that is absolutely what we have to, uh, you know, inculcate in, in education and, uh, I mean, it's in so many different directions. Yeah. Um, that's what we need to. So, and, and there's more uh, studies going right now for depression and everything else. And they're saying what, because it gives you this perspective nudge. It nudges you into a perspective you, you couldn't see before. And that's exactly the metaphor of kind of what we need right now for most people to get uh, out, out away from this entrenched kind of way of thinking. Yeah, I, the, the isolation um, versus connection. Right. Right, which is how we started. Um, look, come back and do this again. What do you say? Uh, sure. Um, let, let me know how you know your audience uh, responds, and I'd be happy to do that. We are definitely on an, uh, what I prefer to re refer to as a uh, an evolutionary threshold. Um, we, we have two different. We have two very different directions that we're going to be going. Um, and uh, so, you know, any way that we can um, catalyze and, and energize uh, the community that is growing globally around, we can, do, we can do this in a different way and we can exist on the planet in a much better way than the way we're doing it right now. So um, I, I haven't lost hope. Um, I, I hope that your, you know, that your audience, I hope this conversation will inspire hope. Um, there are a lot of pioneers, um, and, uh, nonconformists, however you want to, you know, uh, outliers that are out there that are trying to do good things. And we're literally kind of coming together, um, and organizing. And that's what we need to do. We need to get more organized about the, these changes that we want to imbue. I mean, even like the solar punk community, they've developed some amazing imagery for me. Um, and they're in support of the creation of the Atlas Biospheric Design Center, which I'm trying to uh, launch. So, uh, you know, help with that is uh, going to be fantastic if uh, we can get there all the right resources together um, to make that happen. That sounds epic. And we're looking forward to hearing more about that. Uh, and yeah, bring on all the solar punks and the mycology punks and all the punks where we need all the punks we can get. Um, Paul Quiser, wonderful human being, uh, sustainability, biodiversity expert, uh, cool guy. Uh, hang around. We're going to talk right after this, but we'll say goodbye to everybody in TV land. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great time, everyone. Bye.